Welcome to the Physician's Guide to Financial Wellness, the podcast dedicated to helping physicians in Michigan turn their professional success into financial success while enjoying life along the way. And now, here are your hosts, Andrew Mushbaugh and Trent DeBruin. Hi, everyone, and welcome back, or welcome to the Physician's Guide to Financial Wellness. This is Andrew Mushbaugh, and I'm joined, as always, by my co-host, Trent DeBruin. And today, we're going to take a deeper dive into another one of the many fun financial planning topics that everyone loves to discuss, which is health insurance. Yeah, everyone is definitely going to be circling episode number 61 as another date night topic. We're still going strong with our bad dad jokes. Hey, we're fully embracing it. (laughs) Exactly. So what we're going to do is break down this topic into several categories by discussing the key components and terminology to be aware of, an overview of how to think about your health insurance coverage and how it changes over time, understanding the two core phases of health insurance, namely prior to Medicare at age 65 and then after Medicare eligibility at age 65, the planning opportunities available to you in each of the two core phases. And lastly, we'll wrap it up with how to apply and think through creating your own plan for health insurance coverage. So Trent, why don't you start us off with a 101 overview of health insurance jargon? Sure. And this is a good starting point because it's often the stopping point for many people as they get overwhelmed by the volume and complexity of terminology and decide it may not be worth the time even trying to understand all the details. So hopefully this will help explain the key terms and what's important to understand. And we'll start with the simplest component, which is the monthly premium or cost of your health insurance. This is intuitive, but it's simply the amount of money per month or potentially per paycheck you have to pay for a particular health insurance plan. For example, for anyone with health insurance through their employer, you may see on your pay stub or benefits packet $200 a month for self-coverage or $450 a month for family coverage. In other words, starting January 1st of a given year, you'll be able to calculate exactly what you'll have to pay to have health insurance for the year, which is the floor or minimum amount when thinking about your total health care costs. If you happen to have $0 in medical costs in a given year, you could stop here, but that's almost never the case, which is why it's important to look under the hood, so to speak, at the other components of your health insurance plan. This leads us to our next two terms, which are copay and deductible. A copay is simply a set fee you pay for a given appointment or service. For instance, you may have a $20 copay for a prescription drug or a $50 copay for a checkup at the doctor's office. This tends to be a relatively small dollar amount. A deductible, on the other hand, is a much larger dollar amount and it represents the amount of money you have to pay out of pocket before your insurance kicks in and starts covering some of your expenses. To keep it simple, we'll focus on the example of a single person. So let's say you have a $1,000 deductible. What this means is that, in addition to your monthly premiums, you'll have to pay $1,000 for any health care costs you incur before insurance kicks in. When looking at your health insurance options, you may come across a plan with the acronym HDHP, which means High Deductible Health Plan. As the name implies, this is a health insurance plan that has a higher deductible. And in fact, there's an IRS-defined number that qualifies. In 2023, that deductible amount is $1,500 for an individual plan and $3,000 for a family plan. As a quick side note, in order to be eligible for a health savings account, which we'll touch on later, your health insurance plan must be a high deductible health plan, which is why we wanted to mention this. But once your deductible is reached, this is where the next term comes into play, coinsurance. You may see something like 20% coinsurance, which means that after reaching your deductible, you're then responsible for paying only 20% of any medical expenses, while your health insurance covers the remaining 80% of the cost. Lastly, the final important term to be aware of is your out-of-pocket maximum. This dollar amount, which is much higher than your deductible, specifies the most money you'll be responsible for paying for health care in a given calendar year. For example, your plan might have an out-of-pocket maximum of $6,000 or $12,000. Going back to what I mentioned earlier, if you think about your monthly premiums as the floor, aka the minimum you'll pay toward health care costs in a given year, You can think about your premiums plus the out-of-pocket maximum as the ceiling. In other words, even if you have $200,000 of healthcare costs, if your out-of-pocket maximum is $12,000, the most you would have to pay is $12,000 plus your premiums. So the main terms to understand that are universal across health insurance plans are monthly premium, deductible, copay, coinsurance, and out-of-pocket maximum. Outside of those five main definitions, I'll briefly touch on some additional health insurance terminology you'll likely come across. You'll typically see discussion of in-network versus out-of-network 
and differing levels of insurance coverage depending on where you receive treatment. From a high-level perspective, in-network is the preferred group of health insurance providers for a particular plan, such as a certain healthcare system or group of systems. If a provider is in-network, it means the insurance company has likely worked out a special reimbursement rate, and thus you'll pay less in-network. Out-of-network providers, on the other hand, will accept your insurance coverage, but you'll pay more since they aren't preferred providers. And the last item to understand is the difference between an HMO plan and a PPO plan. At a basic level, you can think about a PPO plan as being much more flexible, i.e. access to more providers, ability to see a specialist without a referral from your primary care physician, and generally speaking, greater freedom and easier logistics on your end. The trade-off is that PPO plans tend to have much higher premiums than HMO plans. With an HMO plan, you have to establish care with a primary care physician who acts as your point person, and you must go through them to be referred to a specialist. This is the most cost-effective route, but it also results in more work and more restrictions on your end, given the requirement to go through a primary care physician. And I know I just went through a ton of jargon, but it is helpful to start off with a few definitions before moving on to how to figure out the best plan for you. All right. So the million dollar question is, who likes jargon more, the IRS or insurance companies? I'll go with option C. Both love it equally. I like that answer better. Now, moving back to a higher level, the next area we'll touch on is how to think through your health insurance needs and how they change over time so that you can choose the best plan for you. After hearing the key components of your health insurance plan, the next logical question for most people is, great, but what's the best health insurance plan for me? And unfortunately, this is where we have to give everyone's favorite answer of, it depends. Like most areas of financial planning, it's important to understand all the key variables of a decision and then apply those to your unique life situation and preferences. But bigger picture, we like to break this decision down into two main components, the purely financial side of the equation and your unique preferences. Starting with the financial side of the equation, it's relatively intuitive that there's a big difference, at least in terms of having medical costs throughout the year, between a single 26-year-old who is relatively healthy and has no expected medical costs in a given year versus a family of four with a fifth child expected within a couple of months. And breaking down the financial side of the equation even more, there are four key areas we look at. One, the cost of your coverage, i.e. monthly premiums. Two, the tax benefits, i.e. if you have access to an HSA savings account. Three, any free money offered to you, like an employer making an HSA contribution on your behalf. And four, the break-even point, which I'll elaborate on by going through an example. So the exercise to go through is by starting out and looking at what your quote-unquote floor is with medical costs if you had zero needs throughout the year. For example, using simple numbers, let's assume you pay $100 a month in premiums, have access to an HSA, and receive $500 from your employer for electing the high-deductible health plan with the HSA option. You would have $1,200 in premiums, $100 per month times 12, as your only quote-unquote cost. Now, by electing to the high-deductible health plan, you also receive $500 of free money from your employer. So your true cost is now $1,200 minus the $500 from your employer, or $700. On top of the free money from your employer, you can also contribute to a health savings account and receive a tax deduction. The limit for an individual in 2023 is 3850 if under age 55. So if you contributed 3350 the max contribution limit, minus the 500 your employer contributed, you would multiply that times your tax rate, which we'll assume is 32%, and results in you lowering your tax bill by a little over $1,000. Well, when you subtract $1,000 of tax savings, you'll realize that you are actually net ahead by $372, at least assuming that you had $0 in medical costs. So in this example, the financially optimal choice would clearly be the health insurance plan that results in you paying the lowest monthly premium, provides you with an HSA match, and allows you to receive the tax benefits by making an HSA contribution. However, that's just one end of the spectrum, and it's unlikely you'd have $0 of medical costs every single year. This is where you want to compare your health insurance plan options to find the break-even point, which is simply how much in the way of medical costs would you need to have in a given year to justify paying the higher premiums of the quote-unquote better health insurance plan i.e. the one with a lower deductible, better coinsurance, and a lower out-of-pocket maximum. And to keep things simple, let's assume you calculate that you'd have to have $3,000 in medical costs throughout a year in order for the health insurance plans to be net neutral, or essentially the exact same cost to you when adding in all the factors, premiums, tax benefits, employer contributions to your HSA, and how you actually use the insurance in a given year to cover healthcare costs. Once you have that break-even point, you can then move on to phase two, which is your unique situation and preferences. 
If you have a young family or take certain medications, have certain health concerns, or anything unique to you, you may realize that you'll easily spend more than $3,000 in medical costs and thus would feel better knowing you'll pay less overall in a given year by having the better or more expensive health insurance coverage. However, that's still semi-related to the financial side of the equation, whereas several other important aspects relate to understanding which providers are considered in-network for the plans to ensure that you have access to your preferred health care providers or hospital systems, or you may care more about the flexibility of a PPO, even if it's more expensive, simply for the ease or convenience of knowing that if you do have a medical need come up, it'll be easier to be seen. There's no one-size-fits-all answer to which plan is better, but by going through the exercise of quantifying the financial differences between your plans and then factoring in your unique circumstances and preferences, you'll at least be able to make an informed decision about why you chose one plan versus the other. Yeah, and as with most things in financial planning, it'd be a whole lot easier if there was one right answer as to which plan is better, but unfortunately, it is nuanced and individualized. And that two-step framework Andrew just walked through of first looking at the financial aspects, then cross-referencing them with your unique situation and preferences is universal across all phases of life. But there are some nuances you'll want to be aware of depending on your stage of life. And what we just talked through involved looking at an example of someone with employer-provided health insurance during the working years prior to Medicare at age 65. However, there are other situations to be aware of if you retire prior to Medicare eligibility at age 65 or if you happen to be self-employed. If you retire prior to 65, which is increasingly common, especially within the physician community, you'll need to find health insurance coverage on your own. In some cases, you may be eligible for retiree health insurance coverage through your employer. But for the purposes of this discussion, we'll assume you're responsible for finding coverage by yourself from among the various options available to you. This is where it can often feel like you're looking at a cheesecake factory menu or trying to decide between 100 different investment options within a complicated 403b plan. But starting from a high level, the first thing to be aware of when purchasing private health insurance is that it's very expensive. The monthly premiums can easily be $2,000 a month for a couple. And as a reminder, that's just the floor in terms of what your health care costs will be without any medical expenses throughout the year. So when thinking about or planning for retirement prior to Medicare eligibility at age 65, this is a large incremental expense you'll want to account for in your retirement spending budget during the years between retirement and age 65. Having said that, there are planning opportunities available that you can take advantage of to lower the cost of health care. These won't necessarily apply to everyone, but there's something you'll certainly want to consider or at least be aware of. As we've discussed in prior episodes, when you retire, you have significantly more control over your taxable income in a given year since you no longer have a salary. For example, if you have $200,000 in cash, you could theoretically have $0 in taxable income, or close to it, depending on your situation in a given year. Now, this shouldn't be your goal early in retirement, but because of the flexibility in controlling your taxable income, it does create planning opportunities related to private health insurance. As a result of the Affordable Care Act, with the aim of making health insurance affordable for everyone, the government offers subsidies, or refundable tax credits, to people who purchase health insurance through the government exchange, healthcare.gov, and meet certain income thresholds. The subsidies are based on your income, as determined by your tax return, relative to the federal poverty line, and they can be quite substantial, in some cases $1,000 or more per month, which can dramatically lower the cost of private health insurance. Now, many people might assume that if you have 2 or $3 million of investment assets, you wouldn't qualify for assistance from the government. But because the subsidy is based solely on your tax return, that isn't necessarily the case. Again, it depends on your unique mix of investment accounts, spending, and overall tax plan. But you could imagine a situation where someone decides to retire at 60 and intentionally keep their taxable income low enough to benefit from the tax subsidy during the years until Medicare at age 65, which, depending on the subsidy amount, could result in them saving $50,000 or more over the course of those five years. The main takeaway is that during the phase between retirement and age 65, private health insurance is a large expense that needs to be accounted for. However, there are also ways to mitigate the cost by being strategic with your tax planning, which is why it's helpful to have an overall retirement roadmap well ahead of time so you don't end up leaving money on the table or overpaying for health insurance. Yeah, I still have such a hard time believing how expensive private health insurance is, but it certainly makes you appreciate the value of employer-sponsored coverage. I know, it really does. 
Well, transitioning away from retirement prior to 65, we'll now look at the last phase of health insurance in retirement, post-65 when eligible for Medicare. And we'll stay higher level here, but if you want a more detailed discussion on this phase, be sure to check out episode 25 where we discuss health insurance in retirement, which it's important to note that if you are still employed and eligible for employer-sponsored health insurance coverage past age 65, you do not have to switch over to Medicare, and oftentimes you'll actually be better off and have cheaper coverage through your employer to the point where it doesn't make sense to switch until you retire. In basic terms, there are two components to health insurance after age 65. You'll have Medicare as your primary insurance to cover roughly 80% of your costs, and will want to pair that with a supplemental policy, whether through an employer retiree health benefit or a supplemental policy purchased on your own, to cover the remaining 20%. Between Medicare and the cost of your supplemental policy, you'll have a set monthly premium that essentially covers all of your healthcare needs and allows you to have a much clearer picture of your all-in healthcare costs. So that's a higher level explanation of how health insurance changes in retirement. And the next area we'll touch on is two of the biggest planning items in this phase. Now, when it comes to calculating that set monthly premium for your Medicare insurance, it's important to note that the amount you pay each month is based on the income reported on your tax return from two years ago. So for 2023, the government will base the premium off of the taxable income reported on your 2021 tax return. There's a certain income threshold. In 2023, it's 194000 for a married couple filing a joint return before you start having to pay extra money for Medicare premiums. So this isn't relevant for everyone, but it is an important area to plan around. With that in mind, the most common mistake or missed opportunity, I should say, is for those retiring at or near age 65, because your premiums are based on your tax return from two years prior, and for the vast majority of people, your income declines in retirement, you may be inadvertently paying more than necessary for your Medicare premiums, i.e. your premiums are being based off the tax return from your working years, which will likely show significantly higher income than when you're retired. This is where you can file an income-related monthly adjustment amount form citing a life event, like retirement, where there has been a significant change in your income compared to what's shown on your tax return from two years prior. By filing this IRMA form, you can potentially save up to five or $6,000 in Medicare premiums, depending on what your income was during your working years. So this is low-hanging fruit that not many people know about or take advantage of, but can save you a material amount of money. And the second planning item related to Medicare premiums has to do with your annual tax planning. Because your Medicare premiums are based on your tax return, There are certain income limits you'd ideally like to stay under to avoid having to pay more in premiums. We won't dive into the details here, and this is just one component of an overall retirement tax plan, but to the extent you can, it's important to track and manage your income relative to the Medicare surcharge income thresholds each year to avoid unnecessarily paying more for your health insurance coverage. And as I mentioned earlier, if you'd like a deeper dive on healthcare and retirement, be sure to check out episode 25. Well, that's everything we wanted to cover today, and hopefully it was helpful to walk through an overview of health insurance, a framework for picking the best plan for you, and some of the key planning areas to be aware of over time. So to give a quick recap of what we discussed today, number one, understand some of the key health insurance terminology and jargon, which consists of your monthly premium or cost for health insurance coverage, your deductible, the amount you pay for out-of-pocket costs before insurance kicks in, your copay, a predetermined cost for prescriptions or medical care, your coinsurance, which kicks in after your deductible is met and determines a percentage of any medical costs that you are responsible for with the rest being covered by insurance. And lastly, your out-of-pocket max, which in addition to your premium is the most you'll have to pay for any healthcare costs in a given year. Number two, when deciding on which health insurance plan is best for you and your family, you want to follow a framework by looking at the purely financial side, your premiums, tax benefits, employer contributions, and the break-even point between plans and also look at your unique situation and preferences, looking at things like ease and flexibility, your life stage, and access to certain providers or health systems. And lastly, number three, we discuss the different health insurance phases and how they change over time, with the two most important phases being retirement until age 65, and then age 65 and beyond. Prior to Medicare eligibility at 65, make sure you are aware of how expensive private health insurance coverage can be, incorporate that into your plan, and also be aware of potential tax planning strategies like capitalizing on the Affordable Care Act tax subsidy. After age 65, you'll have Medicare coverage as your primary insurance, which is paired with a supplemental policy, whether provided through your employer retiree health plan or purchased privately on your own. And remember, your Medicare premiums are based on your income from your tax return two years prior, so be sure to take advantage of filing an initial income-related monthly adjustment form, if relevant, to lower your first year's Medicare premiums. 
And to the extent you can, be cognizant of your taxable income each year to avoid going above certain thresholds and having to pay more for your Medicare premiums than necessary. Well, thanks everyone for joining us for another episode of the show. You can find the show notes at the podcast page of our website, mdwmllc.com slash podcast. And if you have thoughts to share or questions you'd like to have answered, please feel free to shoot us an email at info at mdwmllc.com. Take care, everyone, and we'll look forward to talking to you again soon. Want even more ideas, tools, and resources on how to make smart financial decisions? Check out the resources section of MD Wealth Management's website at mdwmllc.com, where you'll find additional knowledge and insight for Michigan physicians, including a blog, ebook, and one-page guides. While there, you can also schedule a 15-minute conversation with Andrew and Trent to learn more about what it means to work with the firm and how they serve physicians. If you've enjoyed the content, please leave a review on iTunes and share with your friends and colleagues. Thanks so much for listening. Andrew Mushbaugh and Trent DeBruin are certified financial planners, principals, and co-founders of MD Wealth Management, a registered investment advisory firm in the state of Michigan. All opinions shared in the show are for general information and are not intended to provide specific advice or recommendations for any individual. All performance reference is historical and no guarantee of future returns. Please consult with your legal advisor, your tax advisor, or your financial advisor before making any decisions. 